a, the thriller graffiti has always been, and I, I don't care what anybody says, you know, it's a, it's a thing of you wanting people to know that you were there, you know, that, that you know, you hollering at the world, look at me, I'm here. You know, you wanted that attention. Even though, uh, paradoxically, you were anonymous, you know, you still wanted that attention. You wanted people to see your name, your mark, wherever you may put, put it, and wonder, who is this person? My mother, my mother took me to a psychiatrist for writing. She, she, uh, they, they said it was a compulsive reactive behavior. I had it everywhere. I mean, I had it underneath my shirt, my shoes. I had it on my sheets. I had it on my bunk bed. I had it on my lampshade. Even in my house, I, in my mom's house, I'd had like little secret places. I had it all over. And people would walk by and didn't even notice it. But someone that writes would say, wow, you did that. It, it gave you almost like an esoteric type of, um, like you belong to a society that no one knew of. You know, that you could be this other person, but yet you can still be yourself and not knowing, really knowing unless you were involved in that circle. When I was a real young guy, and before I even thought about writing graffiti, just some of the uh, memories of being young is like those names are like in the background, on the wall, you know. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, before I even dreamt of, of being a graffiti artist or knew what graffiti was, you know, you knew some of those names, you know. Philadelphia is, is a city of neighborhoods, and, and the graffiti culture brought us, partially the graffiti culture, brought us all, all together, man, and, and that, that helped to bring us together, that put us together, and then we discovered that, yeah, man, yeah, all, all the neighborhoods, Germantown, South Philly, I keep saying that, but it, it was great. We felt like we had this whole city at our fingertips, you know, and the subways and the buses, it was just all part of the fact that you could go out, you didn't just live in one neighborhood, you lived and he said, Philly's a huge city, and we were just having a good time. <laughs> we're originators of hand styles, we're originators of the art form graffiti, we, we're originators of what it is to be a king, or how to become a king, we originated all that right here. Look, in graffiti history, Philadelphia is one of the, one of the main cities. I mean, I think, I think the genesis of graffiti probably was Philadelphia and New York. Um, of course, it's an urban center. Does that mean, look, that and the dollar will get you, what, a cup of coffee at Wawa? I mean, what good is, so Philadelphia is the, the, the head of graffiti. I mean, I don't, to me, that doesn't register as anything that's monumental or important. It seems to be a new language, another mystery confronting us about a city existence already complex and confusing. It challenges us, mocks us in a way, almost begs us in a sense to understand it. The names which leap at us from the walls are strange and outlandish. The scrawling is large, often very precise. The letters carrying a certain pride and boastfulness. The easiest thing is to simply dismiss it as the work of vandals and treat city graffiti the way one is taught to treat stolen goods with suspicion and even contempt. If you were walking around the city, driving around the city, you couldn't help but see all of these names and you can help but see uh, these strange scrawls all over buildings, uh, everything. And uh, so uh, basically I just had a rep reporter's curiosity and wanted to know more about it and to try to understand it and get to the bottom of it because it was so prevalent. Oh my God, kids sprayed name on police car while cool girl talked to the police officer. Boy, do I remember that. Tell me about that story. Well, we were more or less, uh, I believe it was on Market Street, 46 and Market, and a police officer pulled us over and uh, we're, we're walking. We just got off 46th Street uh, L's and um, the cop uh, was talking to me. Then he talked with Eddie, cool klepto kid. And, uh, I, and I whispered to Eddie. I said, Eddie, I made a gesture. Move over, get closer to him like that so I can write my name. I'll, I'll get your name.
I think I was talking to the cop, and, and Earl wrote both our names on it, a kid, and he wrote Cool Earl. Just in the, just write it, it wrote it in magic marker right on the side of it. I know they wanted to kill us. But <laughs> <laughs> the police officer never knew what hit him. And we just got a kick out of that. We got a kick out of that. Bobby Cool, Cold Duck, Chewy, and myself the kid. <laughs> and man, I'll tell you what, I sure look like a kid. <laughs> so do I. Uh, <laughs> we're on the subways, I believe we're coming from downtown, and uh, I'm sitting on one side of the uh, L's in Philadelphia, one's called PTC. Chewy, Louis Colquitt, was sitting on the left side, I'm sitting on the right side. Eddie decides to write Louie, and, uh, or Louie could have wrote his own name with a magic marker, black magic marker. And of course, it was permanent type. <laughs> and uh, Eddie wrote his name. He just wrote Eddie. And Louis wrote Louis. And but I asked Eddie to write my name, and Eddie wrote, to my surprise, instead of Earl, he wrote Cool Earl. And that was the beginning of writing Cool Earl everywhere. I think I was I was writing Ed at one time, and I changed up to the kid uh, because back then I was I had the baby face. Uh, and um, the kids seemed appropriate, and um, I was a pretty, uh, I was a booster, so I took on the handle of Klepto, and cool Klepto kid was perfect. <laughs> it was ideal. Did you even know who Cornbread was at that point, or did no. you hear about him? Um, no, never even heard of him. And then we started hearing about him, and I believe it was Chewy Lewis Colquitt. I don't know if Eddie Kuklepto kid was hit with him when they finally met each other, and it was like instant friendship. As far as who started first between Cornbread, Chewy, and Cool Earl, I would say Cornbread because he was two years older than than myself and Kuklepto kid. Now, now this was a thing we used to do a lot. We would see Cornbread, Titty, or, or the North Philly writers, and we would always put our names up to let them know we were there too. You know, mm -hmm. and, and then then we would put in magic mark we would leave messages, meet us at, you know, because we were trying to meet each other. <laughs> no, 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 how, how we saw we trying to meet I mean this was going on for I mean for years. I know. And we never met each other. And until finally we we, we ended up we hooked up. But we would see their names or vice versa, they would see our names and they put their names up. It was more or less a contest. It was pride. It was uh boasting rights, you know, who's the, the general, who's the lieutenant, who's the, you know, the captain, etc. cetera, um, whose name we can see the most. Those names were every place. You couldn't, you couldn't help but see them. Uh, these kids got around. <laughs> they, were, they, they were amazing, their range, where they were. So it didn't matter if it was, you know, North Philadelphia, it was, didn't matter if it was out by the airport. It was, you just saw their names. During that time, that's the big boy's name were Cornbread, Cool Earl, Titty, um, Neptune, um, Cool Carl, Dr. Star, people like that. They, they were uh, crazy, uh, Tick Tock, you know, all those names were the big names during that time. Oh, West Philly, Cool Klepto Kid. I remember we painted our names, <laughs> <laughs> we painted our names on an I beam. It was on the ground, actually. And we painted our names on the I beam, and they hung it up all the way on the 30th floor. And everybody thought we clamped up the building and put our names, of course. So we played the, yeah, we clamped up the building. <laughs> but I mean, when people would do that, we started, but then it, it started getting into a competition of who could put their name up or, or write their name in the craziest places. Mm -hmm. So we started doing stuff like I'd go try a pair of shoes on and say, oh, these are a little too small. Could you get me another pair? You go get the other shoes on. <laughs> so somebody coming in to try on a pair of shoes and my name is looking at them. <laughs> or in a supermarket, we write our name on, on a box of cereal or something like that. You know, somebody wouldn't even recognize it then and get home, go to open the cereal up and, you know, our name is on the top of it. So we were f trying to find the oddest and the weirdest places to put it, which it, 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 it got all the talk going because people started talking about all these weird places. How in the world did they get their name up there? 
you know, stuff like that. Our lives, every time we did something, our life would be in our, be, be, be in our hands or each other's hands, and we still would, we still would, we still would do it. We even went as far as to put our names inside an elevator shaft. Um, the PSF building, PSFS building downtown. We actually were in the elevator shaft just so we can get our name. Nobody would see it but us, but we actually had our name in the elevator shaft. Now that was something that was stupid, but it, I mean, it was something to do. And then it, it, it started, rumors were, we rode on the Jackson 5's airplane. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we was, of course, we would agree, yes, we did that. And <laughs> we did, uh, uh, you know, it, it was just little stories that would spring up from small things like that, the I-beam, to writing on the airplanes and all this other stuff. We didn't get that far. It was popularity. We write on the walls, and then we go to social outings with our names monogram. We were like movie stars of some of these people. They said, oh, Joe Cool, Block. You the guys who wrote on the walls. That's how we got to know people. We, could, we became very popular all over the city. Cornbread, man, he's the most famous it was. It's a guy named on elephants and stuff like this. You know, and I had, that's pretty bold. You're going to go to the zoo and write your name on an elephant? And red paint, that's crazy, you know. He 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 was writing it, and, and I guess the police came and jumped over the fence and snatched him and took him away. And corn was on the side of the elephant, you know. Because again, we were always trying to find the wildest things you could possibly find that would get the attention of other people, you know. And you know, this of course this was really wild. I mean, this is off the chart to go over a fence and spray paint an elephant. But uh, he did it, so that was a, that would chalk up one for the bread. <laughs> it it pretty much boomed, and we started hitting the newspapers on a constant base. It, you know, different articles started coming out. Then it was a magazine, and it once the magazine hit, it was full blown. I was not at all prepared for the reaction to the article. You know, I knew that they were defacing property. I knew what they were doing. Uh, but he, I was simply looking to it, it explain why they were doing it. You, you know how things go with uh, uh, people's views and opinions. They just looked at the kids not as you know a social phenomenon of any sort, but as criminals. And that's what prompted the outpouring of mail. Uh, and the, we were criticized, I was criticized for glorifying them. I remember that very clearly. You know, in the beginning, we never did look at it as hurting anyone, you know, uh, or destroying property. We looked at it as, well, hey, there's my name. I've been there. Oh, there's a bus going by. There's an L going by. There's, you know, there we go, there we go, there we go, you know? It was just a lot of fun back then. It was a, a release. I w I'm not saying I condone doing it, but that's what was happening at the time. Just like drugs, when drugs came prevalent, you wasn't, we didn't condone that really, but, it, but people do it and they still do it. You know? So this is almost sort of like that. It was our drug during those times. You know? It kept you out of the gangs. Philadelphia was like Vietnam. The gangs were so bad. It was, this is one that I'm still alive. A lot of guys that I grew up with, dead or in jail. It was terrible. A lot of uh, gang activity was going around, going on at that time around the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, it was almost at that time you, you had a choice of what you wanted to do as far as activity in the neighborhood. You was either in the gang or you wasn't. Um, our outlet to uh, choose to not to be from a gang was uh, partially uh, right on the wall. This was uh, illegal. However, right, we didn't see it that way. We saw it as something right, that was necessary, you know, to uh, to fulfill, you know, our uh, our sense of belonging, you know, in, a, in in pretty much in neighborhoods that uh, you know, that didn't um, they didn't offer a whole lot, you know, society didn't offer us a whole lot, right? So we had to pretty much, you know, make up a a, a life for lives for ourselves. 
this was a cry out, you know, to, to kind of like be heard. You know, we were throwing our names out here. Hey, I'm here. This is the kid, cool kid. This is Chewy. This is Cool Earl. You know, you know. I mean, and, and I, I remember being into poetry real strong, and I, and 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 just you know looking back at you know at, at you know trying to analyze myself. You know, I I would say what what was I doing? You know. That I, you know, I, I really got carried away with it. I mean, I know a lot of it was fame, but you know, I also look at it as, as a cry for help. I, I actually believe it was a cry out for help. Today, I hear it's become popular. It's the beginning of hip hop. To my surprise, um, I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was dead and gone. I've been away for so long. Uh, today, as an adult, well, I, you know, when I look at it, you know, it's mindless, senseless, destructive, uh, you know, and of course, I, I, I played a role in this here, but unfortunately, I can't stop or turn back time, but, you know, I do look at it as, as very destructive now, you know, I mean, because clearly, I, I definitely wouldn't want anyone writing on my home. You know, you know, I mean, I would be awfully pissed, you know. It's still, the phenomenon is still out there. It's still interesting. It's still a question that, um, you know, needs to be answered. And it doesn't, there don't, there, the answers don't seem to be coming any easier today than they did when I did the piece all those many years ago. I remember reading this article when it first came out in the Enquirer and the Sunday paper, they used to have this magazine. And when I saw this uh, magazine, today's magazine, with the graffiti writers, Kuro, Chewy, and Bobby Cool, it blew me away because I never knew who they were. They were like mystery guys at that time. I would see their names on the wall, never knew who they were. And I remember reading this article over and over and over and over again. When we started out, our original name was uh, Imperial Casino Persuaders. It was like being in Hollywood, you know, in Philadelphia. It was like, you know, being like, uh, you know, like my smile. It was real bright, you know. It was like, you know, we could do no wrong. There's been stories about the Liberty Bell. <laughs> yeah, uh, someone asked me a story about the Liberty Bell and said that a lot of people had said that John Ski hit the Liberty Bell, but I did not hit the Liberty Bell. I hit the base of it. Uh, but at that time, I was just, you know, testing, testing some of the security at that time and then locations, what the case may be. Uh, at that time, Rizzo, he put out um, $75 or $50 fine. I can't remember what it was. This is back in 73. He put out a fine on me and I was really scared to come out the house and I missed a lot of days of school, one case may be. Another location that I did was uh, the art museum. Me and uh, a young man by the name of Cap, who was a friend of mine in Frankfurt. Uh, me and him went to school together. Me and him wrote down there and I was a little depressed because the media came out and they put his name up there, Cap, the bicentennial kid but they never put my name up there, so I was a little bitter, bitter over that. Around Wissahickon Park, we, I met a couple guys up there, and they created a club called ACS, which was the Hip City Swingers. At that time, there was a, 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 it was a group out called Coolin' the Gang that had a, had a song called Hollywood Swingers, so we came out with a, with a club, which is similar to the name. Cornbread and them did their thing, then you had in the uh, early 70s to like almost the late 70s, you know, ACS, Sam One, um, and other clubs, they took it to a different level. I never knew some 30, 35 years later that graffiti would be like the topic of movies, books, documentaries, because I see old pictures that I did, you know, like the hits that I did back then, you know, I never thought that I would see those hits again. I remember this was uh, going through the um, tunnel between, f what's that, uh, 40th Street? No, yeah, 40th Street to 46th Street. That was, that was one of the longest tunnels there. And that was my first time ever going into that tunnel. Me, Popcorn, um, TSO, and this guy named Joker. 
And this was broad daylight, you know, rush hour, trains coming by like every five, 10 minutes. For me, graffiti was an adventure, you know. It, it was a real adventure, you know, I gained, you know, a little fame, you know, doing it. And after I got a little older, you know, that wore off, you know, a lot of young bucks don't know who I am today, you know, they see old pictures and stuff like that, but they don't know who I am because I was more like a secretive guy, you know. Um, I wasn't like one who went, went, went to the Daily News and like say I'm Donsky, you know, I quit. You know, I quietly came and I quietly went, you know. Right here, right there, that's it. Jimmy Astro, I see the outline. Jimmy Astro was an original, could only, he, he could only existed in Philly. <laughs> He was, uh, I met him a long time ago. Uh, he had a lot of his, I think he was writing like 73, 74, 75, stuff like that. And um, when I met him, he was homeless. Um, he was in an abandoned apartment, uh, abandoned hospital on 50th and Wood Woodland. He, he was ho homeless. But uh, back in the day, Jimmy Astro had a lot of hits. He used to write little sayings like peace, peace and love and uh, 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 still alive in 75, stuff like that. He was definitely a Philadelphia original though. When I was a kid, I had a really bad temper and um, it was exas it, 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 it was uh, expanded on because I stuttered really badly. Um, I was tall and skinny, wore thick glasses. So people would tend to pick on me if they didn't know me. And um, so I used to get in fights all the time. And um, I had gotten to this fight <clears throat> one time around my neighborhood. You know how you had the old men sitting on the porch? They wouldn't stop the fight. They would just watch it. You know, let two guys just beat each other up until it was over and then <laughs> drag themselves over. This old guy, and his name was Burnside. And um, he was one of the neighborhood drunks or, or whatever, and he had no teeth in his mouth. He said, yeah, that, that boy Jay, he done went in a rage on that boy over there. He just went in a rage on him. So people start calling me Rage from then. And um, that's really the origin, uh, the, uh, the origin of that. You know, as a teenager, you start getting more confidence in, in yourself as you get older and stuff like that. And um, so I was writing big, big stuff for Bad Imperial Casanova because I was starting to notice girls and stuff like that. And um, the notorious part actually came from somebody trying to bust on me, you know, trying to tear me down. And it was a guy named Duck. And, uh, you know, Duck, was a, Duck is a legend, a Philadelphia legend. And um, when I was a kid, like 14, 15 year, years old, Duck was really a legend then, you know, he was like a king. And uh, he came around my way once I was playing basketball and he came down my way. So, you know, I was out there tagging, you know, getting some walls, getting some septa, blase, blase. And, but it was nowhere near what he had. And uh, he called himself, I guess, busting on me, you know. Oh, that's that notorious big. He's notorious, he's everywhere. But he was saying it sarcastically. You know, so, you know, I laughed at all, blase, 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 ha, ha, ha. But that stuck with me, you know, that notorious big. And um, I started using it. And um, around that time, I was starting to come and, you know, start to form little designs or whatever, um, different ways to write different things. Um, started inching towards what later became known as wild styles or, or, or wickets. And um, I started messing with NB, trying to put letters together that would, um, um, well, first of all, that would match and that would stand out. And I have old, shoot, if you could find them, old NB hits 
you can see the, the progression of where NB came from and where it eventually got to. I was going to high school, you know, up at Central. And, um, you know, in high school, generally in the boys' bathroom, you see people writing on the walls, you see their names and stuff like that. Well, some of the names I was seeing on the wall in the bathroom, I was actually seeing outside in the city. I finally eventually got to meet these guys, uh, Razor, at uh, 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 Fame, people like that, uh, and they were from a club called KCD. And Razor introduced me to the president of KCD. KCD stood for Club City Decorators. And uh, his name was T-Bone. Well, the name KCD, uh, can't take complete credit. I was, in, in that time, this was uh, uh, 72, 73, and I was taking buses from downtown up into West Philly because I was in, in a band at 62nd and Pine and uh, you know reading all the walls and the buses up in West Philly and there's, there was these two cats hip and poet right hip and poet right they were, they were great I, I love their style but I did see it maybe one time or a couple times hip actually wrote hip your city decorator right I was like oh I like that you know so I figured I'm gonna borrow it Gotta give credit where credit's due, you know, and start club city decorators because everybody had to have these, you know, clubs. And for a while, it was just me. <laughs> Most of KCD was cool, cool dudes. You, you know, they were um, they were white guys, and I never, you know, me being naive, I never really had too many dealings with white people before I got to high school, and. Um, it shocked me that these were white guys because I thought, you know, it was the it was the brothers that was writing on the wall. We we took a ride one night to New York City. This had to be '75. I guess I was 15 or 16, old enough. One of us had a car. Me and my boy Streak and Looney Tune. We'll, we'll use their name, those names. Uh, we drove up to New York City to, just to park the car and and ride the subways and look at what was going on. And we had been up there the years before and saw that they're what we call plain style, in other words, not double wide filled and stuff, uh, was just completely not happening com compared to the Philly lettering. But it started to turn around when they got into that double wide stuff. And we went down to the subway station and the first train rolled up and we about lost our minds, man, because it was this whole like jungle scene on there. <laughs> And we couldn't even really understand what the lettering was, but it was all spray painted and it was like top to bottom, whole car with this, I think it was like a, a tree with this parrot coming out of it in somebody's name. We were like, oh, smack, you know, and that was it. And we, and we you know, brought New York style, what we call New York style, back to Philly. We started doing double wide letters. And, and as far as I know, and I doubt if too many honest people would dispute it, you know, great claim to fame, right? We started New York style in Philly. You know, Sly Artistic Masters, I came up with that name um, when I was a kid. There was a bunch of gangs when I was growing up. And it seemed like each gang had their little social club, you know, tied in with, with it. And around my way, uh, there was a gang and their social club was called Imperial Black Masters, IBM. And I thought that was the coolest name in the world. I was a pretty good pickpocket, you, you, you know, um, you know, so I, you know, I consider myself sly or slick. The artistic part came from the fact that my crew, I wanted to be the best writers in the world. That was my mandate. You know, I had to have the best writers in the city. I didn't care about their rep, their rep on the wall. You know, I didn't care how many hits they had or anything like that. I just had to have the best writers. If you can see that this is an end, okay, a regular graffiti type end. Okay, what I did basically was I kind of rounded it off so you can understand that that's an N from, from that. That would go to that. Put a little loop on it, okay, and then from having an ism, you just develop your own certain steps to it so that that eventually becomes this, okay? My B used to have a guy named Tab, who was really popcorn. His B was like that. 
I took his B and just jazzed it up. Put my own thing to it. Okay, she got N with the B. Now, it looks simple now because I explained it. But if you've never seen that before, okay, you would still be wondering how the hell I came up with it. And even with me telling you, it's still got to be up in your mind how he come up with it. It's the ism. You either got it or you don't. Okay, patting myself on the back. I'm loaded with it. <laughs> and what they call wickets now? That's... And that, that's what they call wickets. That's what they call wickets. And Philly is known, not just United States, but worldwide for wickets. Back in the 70s and 80s, when we used to come down here, Philadelphia was like in a very pivotal part of cultures, the music, the sound of Philadelphia, gambling huff. Uh, it was just a lot going on in this city. The, 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 this is a football, I mean, this is a basketball town. This is a boxing town. This is a good town to go to school. Philly was definitely hot. I used to uh, hang with this boy. He was my best friend. Um, his name was Brett, bad news Brett. He was from this club called HCS. The more I hung with Brett, and the more I was around these cats, it was like, like Hip City Swingers was like the club to be from. And it was like, the more I became obsessed, like, oh, I need to get from this club, I need to get from this club. We was chilling out at CH crib one day. It was me, CH, Cool High, Tunk, and I believe CD was there, Cool Duck, I'm not sure. I know it was a, th a third party from ACS. And me and Brett, because me and Brett, they, we used to be like this, you know? And um, Brett was trying to get me in a club. So they was like, let me see you write. So I tried to write something, and, and Brett was like, no. Nah. And he took the, the pen real quick, and he wrote sack for me. And he showed it to him, and it was like, you ain't write this sack. You ain't write that. Brett wrote that. Write it again. And then they was like, no, you can't get from the club. You can't get from the club. So on a ride home, Brett, he sort of inspired me. I had to say that. Brett inspired me with the writing all the way around because he was like, man, fuck them cats. Come out with your own club. My first introduction to graffiti had to been in 75, maybe 74. Let's see, uh, it was a friend of mine named Breck. A truck pulls up. It was as simple as this. It was we, W-E-E. -E. He asked me if I could read it. I couldn't. I thought it said me or whatever, Chinese or whatever. From that point on, I was stuck until this very day. After a while, I tried writing, tried to hang with Brett, couldn't keep up, didn't have a hand, wasn't fast enough. So me and PM, we pretty much were like uh, wanderers. And uh, so we created our own club, Club International Wall Writers. And not getting into ACS sort of made me have a little grudge, like I'm gonna let them see what they missed out on, okay? I'm gonna get my own club and my own crew and we gonna run the city and we put Uptown back on the map. When you first start writing, you know, you come to the meetings, because the meetings used to be down at um, 11th and Market back in the day, like 1978, 77, 76. The meetings are at 11th and Market under the, under the train thing, and you used to come upstairs, it would be a kiddie seat, and everybody would meet there. So I'm, so I'm there, and all the writers did tasks there, JK there. This is back, way back in the day. And um, when you come up, you know, they'd be like, what you write? Raz, oh, yeah, OK, whatever. I mean, what you write? Oh, I'm cat. Oh, what's up, man? Yeah, yeah, you know, I seen what you did over here and this and that and that. So it would be like that. And they have their, like, groups and their crews. So we used to always ask to get in the crews when we first started writing. Yo, can we, get, yo, can we be down? Nah, young boy, you can't be down. In Philadelphia, what was important was learning how to write your name real wicked. Nobody was writing to do a filling. Like, it wasn't about doing a filling. It was like how wicked you could write your name top to bottom, that was the idea. So when we asked to get in Sam, if we couldn't write Wicked, he'd be like, nah, you can't get in this club. So I was like, you know what, I'm starting my own daggone club. I'm tired of going around here 
begging these guys to get in their club. I started my own daggone club. I was like, nothing is above the law. So I was like, well, we're going to have a crew called law. Norton's going to be ab above us. And I was like, well, what's law going to stand for? So then I was like, well, I do write lunatic grass sometimes. I said, so lunatics at writing. Like, we're lunatics at writing. There were a couple guys in KCD that had started some bubble letters and coloring them in. But it was really primitive. And what had happened is then Jace, uh, Mr. Blint and Pizzazz hit the, put these uh, bubble letter fill-ins with color and they were doing that on the expressway. At the same time, Clyde, Istro, um, a couple other guys, uh, Raid, Pizzazz, were doing these kind of um, bubble letters on the subway surface lines. And um, we decided to make this group XTC. And um, we just tried to take it to a, to a really a New York style. Istro, first of all, he was an art student. He went to art school. So he was an artist. And um, what he did was, and Eastro, you know, like most graffiti writers, had a very interesting personality. He did this mothership. You know, I know where the mothership came from. The mothership came from Parliament Funkadelics, because he was into the P-Funk and the mothership connection, and they always had this spaceship. It's like one of the dopest hits in Philadelphia history that he done, definitely. Well, my brother hung with MB, and MB used to come through the neighborhood and, you know, with his Jeff cap and his jean jackets and all that fancy gear he had. And uh, he'd walk through, and he was a guy that, that had, you know, many styles, many hand styles, many this, many that. He was a guy that I was aware of that was, you know, all over the place. I remember going to Jersey and seeing his shit, you know, on all the overpasses, underpasses, MB, 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 MB. That guy was... As far as I'm concerned, all city, and he did it all, man. From he, he didn't just tackle one area. He did it all. Tags, wickets, which were wild styles back then. We used to call them wild styles. Even even just the tag, and 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 throw ups, bubble letter, whatever, man. He did this shit all with everything. Every spot is the right spot. Um, uh, to be a king, you gotta uh, really apply yourself and put the work in and go out there and hit as many walls, alleys, roofs, tunnels uh, as you possibly can, including buses and trains, etc. And I did it all. Uh, when I ran for mayor, uh, I would say it was the number one issue uh, facing the city. Uh, and because uh, beautiful buildings were made to look ugly and defaced by someone uh, just simply writing on the walls. And uh, people were very concerned about what could be done. Uh, when I was elected mayor, the number one appointment I made uh, was the director of the anti graffiti Network. What struck me uh, before I ran for office in the 1970s, and especially in the early 1980s, uh, what struck me was the fact that uh, the city was ugly, that people had to face all kinds of buildings, and it became known as Graffiti City. Uh, and people would talk with me when I was running for office, who rode the train through the city, and said, why are young people destroying your city in the way they are? When I first started working for Anti-Graffiti, um, our office, when I first walked into our office, it was really pandemonium. There were uh, you know, police officers, there were these community organizers, there were a, a lot of kids everywhere, and they had backpacks that would click when they walked, and we'd always say, oh, what's in the backpack? And they'd say books, and we'd say, yeah, right. And then they'd go in the hallway, and they'd write in the hallway, and they'd right in the elevator and the police were chasing them and it was really pandemonium, but there was something really interesting about it. And you know how moths want to be close to the flame? The graffiti writers wanted to be close to anti-graffiti. It was interesting. Part of this was the push-pull of like cops and robbers. But the other thing was that anti-graffiti had these un unbelievable opportunities for kids. Uh, we offered employment for long periods of time. I mean, kids could get paid to paint. And we also helped get kids back in school and, and provided young people with lots of other opportunities. So that was pretty extraordinary. Um, and so I, I felt like I was hired to run an art 
component for anti-graffiti. I wasn't given much direction. I was given this little box of art supplies, and so I had to figure out what to do. So my first position was, I have to get to know these graffiti writers to understand what would be palatable to them. I didn't want to alienate them, and I understood that if I acted uh, in a punitive manner, I, I was just going to send them away. My big break came when um, my former boss gave me an assistant, and my assistant was Tran, who was probably one of the more uh, notorious graffiti writers. And uh, through Tran, I was able to really deconstruct and infiltrate the graffiti world. And so Tran and I started working together, and as we worked on these small murals, he started talking to me about the graffiti world. And what he did was he was able to illuminate it for me in ways that I I would not have been able to get at that information. For example, he explained the hierarchy of this world, that there were graffiti uh, gangs or, or clubs, um, they were called both, and that they uh, would often meet at 10th and Cecil B. Moore, and they would figure out where they were going to write on walls, and that they made these very strategic decisions uh, because they wanted to uh, get their name known around the city and some of them were more artistic and were going to figure out strategic places where they would do their graffiti pieces. And then he told me who the leaders of these groups were and that if I was able to get to the bigger name graffiti writers, then I could get to the younger kids who were following them. That this was a world that was highly organized and that's what I didn't understand. And I was very struck by that. I thought, well, this is really interesting because if these guys have talent and organization, then there's a real potential uh, for us to try to permeate that world and sort of uh, mine the talent that exists there and really uh, get them involved in a community public art program. I thought there were just a group of destructive young people uh, who were out there basically uh, just trying to deface buildings and probably bored, did not know, did not, did not have anything to do. Uh, and now, uh, as I look back on it, I realized that Many of them uh, were people who wanted a way to express themselves artistically. Uh, and I believe firmly that they were trying to send a message to the adults. We need help, we need support, we need to be put into a positive framework to make this work. Uh, so I went from uh, regarding them uh, as criminal uh, to regarding them as a group of people uh, actually urging us to pay attention to their messages and to bring them in and let them become a part of something very, very positive. As a young, young kid, I used to go on the L and my dad would take me, you know, we'd get on at Somerset and we'd go to uh, Bridge and Pratt and then head to 69th Street and I'd always stand on the front car and open a window and look out like many uh, of us have, I believe, and, you know, see all the rooftops. You know, everyone had different styles, including myself, but I got into the uh, straight letters and, uh, you know, which years ago, when I was coming up, we used to call them New Yorkers because that's what they were, you know, out of. They weren't called throw-ups or black and silvers or, or, or straight letters, but that evolved. And I took the straight letter to another level, and that was like my tag, my stamp. And I put it everywhere all across the city. So everybody was tagging as far as I was concerned. And, uh, you know, North Philly especially was like whacked with like tag after tag after tag, just blown up on everything. And I just put my big K-A-I-R that, you know, you could see for blocks. And I would put it in places where people would be like, man, how, how did he do it? And that's, that's what I did, you know, I just, so everyone noticed it. It was like a, an adventure. Like I was, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, as, as we're talking about it today, uh, it was like, like almost like a, some 007 shit. Like, I, you know, to, to, to find the way up the roof and get on the roof and jump from roof to roof and all. It was, it was more of the thrill that added up to the, the total explosion, you know what I mean, of, of completing the roof and then completing it and, and looking out. You know, and, and I would. I'd go to the edge and I'd look and I'd, the L, when the L used to ride by, man, that was, that was like, you could see all the people in the car 
you know, on the trains and they couldn't see you, you know, but it, it just was, and the driver would be out sometimes out the window and it was just, I don't know, just the noise and the smell and the whole, the whole thing, man. It was, it, it was exciting, man. It was, it was badass. But now that I'm older and I look back at it, obviously it was for notoriety and things like that, but it was also to do with my, my, you know, uh, hustling and, you know, Kensington slash North Philly hustler type thing. And, and, uh, you know, just the whole lifestyle of the, 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 the material stuff and the, and the hustling of drugs and money and, and, and gold and, and cars and sneakers and, and gear. And I just took it from there. It was just another part, you know, violence. <laughs> What other activity do you have as self-proclaimed king, you know? Um, only in graffiti. I'm the king of wool. Says who? Says me. You know, that's, that's graffiti. The funniest thing about graffiti, graffiti is all about reputation. Rep, as we call it. And what is the rep? Oh, I'm a bad dude. Oh, I'm out there everywhere writing my name. I'm doing all this massive destruction. You know, then it's like I'm getting all the girls. I'm making all the money. You know, and your rep moves on. Well, what happens in life? Life is, then you get older and you're like, damn, what am I going to do now because this is rep that I worked so damn hard to build up, you know, to make this monster of a, of a character, this alter ego of me. I've made this into this huge thing. Now I've got to, now I've got to break it down. Now I've got to be the, the father, the husband, you know what I mean, the son, you know, the employer, the employee. I've got to break all this rep down into this responsible guy who's living his life. And that's a huge, huge step down and task, you know, because we can't, what are we going to do? You're going to, you know, you're going to come to this reconciliation at 30. You're going to come to this reconciliation at 40. You're going to come to this reconciliation at 50. But you will come to this reconciliation, you know, or you will be dead. I mean, that's how life works. I start selling drugs and in, uh, in 1990, and uh, before that I dibbled and dabbled, but I, I, it wasn't nothing like that. And I remember smoking pot for the first time and you know counting it when I was like 17, like, oh man, I smoked pot. And, and I was doing pills and one thing led to another. I was doing all kinds of shit and hustling and getting paid and cars and all this other shit. And, and I liked it, you know what I mean? I saw my dad bust his ass and I didn't want to do that. I wanted that shit now for free and, 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 and if I couldn't get it, uh, um, through, through myself and my hustling, I would take it from somebody else, and that's just how it was. Actually, where I'm at now is, you know, I, I live in the uh, suburbs of Atlanta, and, um, you know, I'm, I, I've been with a company, uh, a, a retail company, a big retail company, one of the number one retailers, uh, and uh, I've been with them for 11 years, and I am a, a salaried uh, assistant store manager, and I do very, very well. And, um, you know, I, I got a big home and uh, worked hard for it, which is, you know, hard to say about many, many years ago. And I have a beautiful wife and uh, uh, two beautiful daughters. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy today. I'm, I'm happy. I, I, I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I, uh, I feel as though I'm a good father, a good dad to both my girls. And, uh, you know, good husband, good son. And uh, my mom used to say, it's a joke, 
um, she'd say, yeah, you know, you'll be on a roof at 55 or 60 with your wife and kids, you know, uh, doing shit, care, you know, but uh, that was always kind of a running joke and still is to this day, but whatever. When I first started writing, I really didn't have any, you know, confidence, any ego, any anything. Didn't really have a definition of who I was or where I was going, but ended up, maybe this wasn't the best path, but it, it gave me something, gave me something to work on, gave me something to work with, defined who I was to an extent, took me through the, the urbanness of graffiti rather than, you know, shirt and tie business world or something else that it would have been. And, and it, it kind of defines me for who I am. I'm, I'm not just, I don't even know. It, it, I'm Nax, it, it's a state of being. But there was times when my daughter was first born in 93, we'd hang out on Fifth Street, you know, catching tags and, and bullshitting. And I'd have my five month old daughter down there with me, two in the morning. You know, we'd take her on routes. We'd, <laughs> I, I one time walked a route with her baby coach, had cans stuffed under the, the bottom, just walked along like a regular dad, caught tags here and there. Nobody suspected that the guy with the baby was writing on the walls. So it, it, it's been a part of my daughter's life, her entire existence, and she's embraced it. They, they've all embraced that daddy's next. That's who he's going to be. It's different with females because you have to be out there at a certain time and be in the way certain people dress. Like, I can't be out there late at night. I'll get raped or whatever, but I try to go out there and get my name. To me, graffiti is in Philly like a man's world. So I'm a female, and I love the fact that I can sit here and write something, and they can say, oh, she did that. And they could, you know, like just... She did that and she's pretty and she's not no butch girl, no tomboy. Like she actually went out there and did that with her hair done and nails on and, you know, heels or whatever. Like I just love that feeling of just being in a man's world and getting to a point where I could do it better than males. Yeah, and pretty much this was one that I had did with Nate Rock and it was pouring rain while I was doing it. And it was about like two o'clock in the morning and um, bike cops kept passing by so we had to like duck in between here and it was like since it was raining the mud was sliding and stuff but as you can see it came out nice like the paint didn't drip or anything like that it still dried up but that was like one of my second ones. Um, I did this one at the reservoir and I really liked this one because it was kind of different it was going down it was straight I added like hearts it kind of reminds me of Minnie Mouse for some reason but like I really like this style the straight better. This is my picture. <laughs> I cover my face. I just show my eyes. That's how it should be. Nobody, it should be a mystery in this game. And this is, this is the picture more clearer. And as you can see, everybody's stuff is like really small. Mine is huge. It's like go big or go home. <laughs> That's how I see it. I had a rumor going around that guys were writing my stuff and you know, us females, we have to put it out there because guys will try to take our credit. This was me and the old Edison. I don't show my face. <laughs> but yeah, I really like this picture because it's like the color and just me having my name by itself and me being right there and you seeing all this, like the place that I was in that I was doing this at. Like it's not no clean place where my hands are clean. Like girls do get down and dirty. These are some boots that I did. I usually inquire like my graffiti into my clothing. I do hats and boots and all that stuff. But of course I wouldn't wear this while I was going out painting because that's just asking yourself to get in trouble. But I'm very artsy. Like I usually carry my camera or my cell phone when I'm doing a route because like I said with the buff and all that stuff, like I'll come back at six o'clock in the morning and my, sh my crap will already be buff. Like, so I try to carry a camera around because I know it's not going to be there by the time I come back.
I was sketching uh, a, a piece on a piece of paper, and uh, this lady saw me sketching, and she was a, a fashion designer. So she hired me to do uh, some some graphics for for a nightgown, actually. And the nightgown went to uh, this contest in Europe. It did pretty good. So I was like, wow, maybe I could take this to another level. So I started doing uh, graphic tees and I got into graphic design. And that's how I make my living right now, actually. Uh, and thanks to Graph, I got into that, actually. So, Graph helped me out and fucked me up at the same time, which is weird, but I love it. It feels good just to paint, you know what I mean? Getting out there, writing on shit, people seeing it, people talking about it, people taking pictures of it. It's all good. <laughs> Shit. Okay. That's good. All right, cool. In the 80s, up, up until the early 90s, I wasn't really paying attention to the walls because, you know, I got married, raised a family, moved to Jersey. I wasn't really paying attention. I didn't know really that, um, Graffiti was still bumping like, like it was. And then this guy uh, named Raz called me out of the clear blue. I had known Raz since he was a kid. Called me up from out the clear blue, told me about these b-boy barbecues that they were having. And how people wanted me to come down and everybody wanted to meet me and people were still talking about me and stuff like that, which was amazing to me. So I came down to the meeting it was like he said, and I seen a whole bunch of people I hadn't seen since the 70s, so that, that, was, that was great. Then it dawned on me, you know, it was evident that graffiti was bumping all over the world. People from Switzerland was, was there talking about Philadelphia graffiti. And, and it amazing, they was talking about wild styling. They was talking about Sam, you, you know, Sam won. And it, it amazed me. You know, they wanted, they was treating me like I, I was some kind of rock star or something. I never even knew. And then with the internet the way it is now, it's just blowing up all over the world. Germany, different countries and stuff. I never would have thought it. In a million years, I never would have thought it. Look. Every time I see stuff like this, it just made me want to go get some cans. <laughs> it really does. We're gonna go, we're gonna go paint, man. Uh, we gonna go paint? Oh, man. You know, you, you like the 80th person who told me that. I keep telling people, I'm a danger because I can't run no more. <laughs> All the cops got to do is walk after me and they got me. We have over 3,000 murals in the city, but I think more important than that number, I think we've become a real vehicle for community public art, that we are an organization dedicated to providing art to communities and neighborhood groups, libraries, churches, recreation centers, schools, really making sure that citizens have access to art. It's a lot about access. And we're also very involved in providing art education to young people around the city. And that's, it's a wide variety of young people. We provide programs for kids who, you know, whose lives are intact, who've never been in trouble. And then we provide many programs to kids whose lives have really fallen through the cracks. I mean, personally, that's where my real love is. Um, I, you know, those years at Anti-Graffiti, they really informed me in a very deep way. And so I feel a personal connection to young people who have no access to art, but have talent and strength, gifts, potential that, that have just gone unrecognized. We've turned Philadelphia into an outdoor museum. Uh, we have a waiting list of 2,000 people who want murals. 
uh, right now in this city. And to me, that is a profound testament about the impact of art in our lives. Today, as I ride around the city and look at the very buildings that used to have graffiti all over them, I realize what a stark contrast it is between uh, 1970, 1980, early 1980s, and uh, the, the 1990s and beyond, uh, how positive uh, there, there has been uh, a movement towards cleaning it up, and more often, the fact that uh, all those ugly buildings have been replaced by uh, murals, uh, all those ugly defacing of buildings have been defaced, uh, uh, that were defaced have been replaced by murals. Uh, and, and what a wonderful, beautiful city it is that, uh, that a program that started uh, to try and engage young people in a positive manner was able to stop uh, a very destructive habit in this city of young people writing on walls and to create out of that an internationally renowned murals arts program uh, and to see a city that has blossomed uh, beyond anyone's expectation out of that is something which I'm very, very proud of. <laughs> yeah, boy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's this? <laughs> oh, yeah, the eyebrows. The yeah. eyebrows. But, but, yeah. but notice the difference. It, it, it ain't that anger look. You, you, you see what I'm saying? See, and, and no, that, no, and no, I didn't even, no, I didn't even realize I was doing it. I'm, I'm serious. It's expressions that you, that, that you generate out yourself. Okay. I didn't even realize that, that it has changed. From that anger that I had back then, something different. You know what I think? I think what it is. I, I think the compulsion in me, writing on walls, has rolled into a fishing rod because what I had here and that compulsion to go here and there and everywhere, I do now with a fishing rod. I, I fish as much as I did that. Now, well, maybe not as much as I did that. I fish as much. I think that's a big difference. I think the fishing has replaced the void that I had there. When I put that down, you know what I mean? I found something else to replace that void. Oh, okay. You know? And I have. I have. Because I, so, I, I, so, you, so you replace the talent with something else. Yeah, and I enjoy it. And, I, and I'm good at it. I'm good at fishing. Right, there's another one down there. Walmart has covered all walks of life, the black, the white, the Asian, the Latino. They go to some of the best schools in the city, private and public. Flash freshness, first city, first element. Graffiti gods put it up like the worst terrorists. Scale on a wall, round with their regiments. Arsenals of aerosol, yes, the flat specialists. That Philly shit where we flex the illest scripts. Tall prints, the paint drips on your newest kicks. Duck the court case, can't tuck the North Face. Hazmat and backpack stored at the war base. This is for the ghosts that roll. Ready to die, catching up highs while y'all sleep. Whips to the wrist, carve his own niche. One sniff of the shit, he starved the hit bricks. This, that, flat, black, and silver flow. Caught in the barbed wire, blood leaking from your elbow. Hang on for your life, tight grip on the rusto. If you must know, all y'all is typo. All my Philly heads, throw your hands up. Hands in your hand, throw your mans up. Clown the cop force, just to get a rep. School by my old heads on my front steps. Right, he's standing on shoulders, and it don't count if it's standing.
pencils or posters Man on a mission, have no regard What he wouldn't do for five minutes in the yard When he write his name, he scarred a chart earth Bomb when he blitz, shit, I'ma hit the ball first Full with him, throw wisdom on side the buildings Tax these children all over kingdoms Peace the cat is, I'm still king of the county Talking all city, not just back streets and alleys Rally a title, turn days to all-nighters this is Dark Riders, homage to Wall Riders. All my Philly heads, throw your hands up. Hands in your hand, throw your mans up. Land the cop force, just to get a rep. School by my old heads, on my front steps. All my Philly heads, throw your hands up. Hands in your hand, throw your mans up. Land the cop force, just to get a rep. School by my old heads, on my front steps. Obsessed with this um, wall writing thing, you know what I'm saying?